Hey, Mr. Football, let's play some football. Hey, Mr. Football, let's throw some footballs. Everybody on the football field, let's play some football. Mr. Football, it's time for some football. <laughs> yeah. And that's uh, okay. because you didn't do that damn song. It's the one song I was excited to hear. Well, that's not true. But it was a song I was excited to hear, and we did not get it. Welcome back to Carter Explains Football, everyone. Carter here. <laughs> um, and with me today yeah. is our usual host, or uh, the man who is learning the football, <laughs> football uh, Callum. It's me. Hello. And for our... Uh, <laughs> Good Lord, Sydney. Um, yes, we have a special guest today for our Super Bowl and off-season discussion. It is uh, fellow Disney desk host, Sydney. Are you okay? You need a minute. Come on, it wasn't that funny. Oh my God. I you don't know, know I laugh at my own jokes, and I'm not even laughing at it anymore. I. Yes, hi, I'm here. Hi. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So for this episode, we are wrapping up your first season of the first season of Carter Explains Football. And I thought it'd be fun to bring Sydney on because weirdly, um, she also decided to get into football this year and um, throughout the year would ask me questions or be chiming in on the games. Um, my favorite moment was when the Philadelphia Eagles traded for Robert Quinn and she messaged me. Uh, tell me everything you know about Robert Quinn with a gif of a man pointing a gun at me. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, Sydney, if you want to talk briefly about your football experience before we get into the Super Bowl, um, what um, what motivated you to get into the season this year? Um, that's a good question. I, I've always been, like, a Philly sports fan just, you know, like, through osmosis. You just <laughs> – just by being raised right. here um, – but I never really, like, had a thorough understanding of it. I learned a little more when I started working at Hooters, though. When you work at a sports bar, you get to go home when the game's over. So uh, oh, I learned a little more about it. <laughs> um, I think I was never drawn to... I probably would have liked football a lot earlier if I understood it, but it was always a very confusing game to me. Um, and it still is, even though I feel like I've learned so much. Um <laughs> But this year, I just needed some kind of hobby. My therapist would probably say I needed a distraction. <laughs> um, I just, like, wanted... I, But I think I'm always like that. I think I always need something to do with my brain, sort of idly in the background of that sort of takes up the space in my life. And I see why men make this their personality type. Yes. Because... Um... It's very um, easy. It comes with color coding. Because you don't yeah. have to, when in doubt, you know, you don't need to know what to say to anybody so long as there's, like, sports going on. Yes. You always, you, you don't have to, you don't have to have a personality if you <laughs> keep up with sports. I don't know how You're long always... I've gotten away with not having personality for this long. Like, right. it's working. I've gotten shockingly far. You always have something to just, like, mindlessly regurgitate um and busy yourself with um and i think i just needed something to like get into and be excited about and so i was like you know what i'm gonna do sports this season this was like right around when the season or like right before football and basketball was starting and i was supposed to watch both i was supposed to watch both football and basketball and it's uh, like if i'm being honest it's probably because like, I, I probably ended up latching onto football a lot more because the Eagles were doing exceptionally well and the Sixers were not. <laughs> right. To start the year, the Sixers were abysmal. And yeah. I will say on that point, the thing about football is it really is omnipresent now. Like, they have taken over almost the entire calendar year, which is funny that I'm like, oh, we're getting into the offseason. And it's really, as Rich Eisen, a prominent commentator, described, it is just the non-playing season. Like, a lot of things still yeah. happen when they're not playing football right now. So, right. like, even I'm only just getting into basketball and slowly getting radicalized against white people because of the MPP discussion. Right. Uh, short version, uh, 
a a chubby white uh, Serbian is about to win the MVP for the third straight year, and I'm like, hold up, we're really going to put him in the same category of Bill Russell, Wilt Chamberlain, and um, Larry Bird? Let's not do that. And yeah, it's a mess. Sure. But anyway, yes, anyway. And you picked a hell of a season to get into. I this. sure did. Yeah, for my like, you know, first dip in the pool, I sure got it right uh, because yes. I picked a team that went on to win 16 games in a row, Including I believe it was. And yeah, and then was undefeated in the, weren't we, were we undefeated in the playoffs? Well, no, no we, we weren't. Um, who the Super Bowl oh, well. counts as the playoffs, Sydney. But yeah. No, I meant like before, or in any of the games leading up to it. Um, well, no, if you lose in the playoffs, you're out. It's not like- Oh, right, right, right. Like a, yeah, it's I, not my like My brain has almost been tournament. wiped clean. Okay, yeah. Yes, um, I will geez. say, because we're doing this a little you know, later than I was planning, I really did have to reset my brain and be like, all right, yeah. what again? Because I, I was like, a lot of this. Yeah, no, I feel like like my brain's like fight or flight kicks in after we lost, and I'm just in like, I'm in like the 12 stages of grief right now. Um, yeah. But where I'm just now coming into acceptance. But like, I don't like back to um how i like why and how i got into it this season like i don't do anything half-assed like i like i have like i as a person have no passive interest if i'm right. into something i'm obsessed with it and then i and i like don't put it down so i like studied and i and you know like you are my football tutor and i ask yes. you my questions um like explain all this jargon to me I honestly and... brought Sydney on just to be like, guys, I actually am good at this. I like, I'm trying yeah. with Callum. Callum's like yeah. my, my, my struggle people that I need to find some alternative means. Like I need to play a game of chess yeah. with him and be like, can you point to the king? And then he points to the king and then I move his finger to point at him. And that is like, yeah. that's what you can achieve. I'm like, oh, from Kung Fu Panda. <laughs> yeah, you think I, I can't to... do football, but eventually and then I, see you if I get the right motivation. Week, You've mm-hmm. inexplicably climbed up a scaffolding to get a cookie. And I'm like, okay, yes. I can figure this out. I just need to rethink this. Wow. <laughs> yes. Um, well, that leads us into our discussion about... So the Super Bowl happened, and it was the Kansas City Chiefs versus the Philadelphia Eagles. Now, Callum, it's funny that you moved from Pennsylvania to Texas. You moved from one football crazy place to arguably the football capital of the world. Like, Texas football well i guess their college teams have kind of lost their luster in the last few years but like that's like the heart of football like if you win a state championship in texas you are basically mint like at a high school level at a college level you are basically a hero like vince young um the former university of texan texas quarterback had a pretty mediocre nfl career but he is still beloved in Texas because he's the guy who took the Texas Longhorns to the national championship over the USC Trojans. So, like, you're in football mecca right now. What did you end up doing? I wanted to ask, what did you do to celebrate the game? Um, so, initially, I started watching in my apartment, just, like, hanging out on my couch. Mm-hmm. And then me and a couple other people went to a restaurant, like one of the, like a sports bar type place to watch it and uh it was very crowded of course which makes sense and i was surprised there was actually a good amount of people wearing eagles jerseys really um yeah there was like there's i would say maybe 30 percent compared to the rest of them being chiefs and uh we watched it while eating food and the food was very good but the game was not so that was that oh well yes because they lost it is an interesting an interesting tidbit about the Kansas City Chiefs is they were originally a Texas team. They were originally uh, the Dallas Chiefs, or I forget what their original name was. But literally, the AFC, which is the conference they're from, was formed because Lamar Hunt was like, hey, NFL, can I have a team in Dallas? And they're like, eh, we're not really looking at Dallas to be a market right now. And he was like, well, I'll show them. I'll make my own football league. And it'll be all the cool cities. Buffalo. Denver. (laughs) They did get L.A. in there because originally the Chargers were L.A. So that was fine. But yes. um, And then it's funny. He moved the team anyway to Kansas City. Um, 
But yes, and Sydney, you've talked to me personally, but um, do you want to talk about, you ended up going all out for uh, oh, yeah. celebration. Oh yeah, no, I was, this truly was um, like the most euphoric day of my life and also truly the most tragic all in one day. Yes. Um, but yeah, no, I, I was going to spare no expense at this event. Um, but it, like, outside of football, I had a very lovely Galentine's Day brunch that I went to, but I showed up in, like, all Eagles gear, and I had on, like, green lipstick, um, and I, like, was like, I'm in game mode, nobody fucking talked to me, happy Galentine's Day, and, um, and everyone was like, you're doing the Lord's work, thank you, um, and so my friends and I, a couple of my friends and I, we drove down to um, South Philly, um, everywhere in Philly, like they, everywhere sells like tickets, um, like every bar that's near like Center City. I, I mean, any bar in the whole city is selling some kind of ticket to, the, to this kind of event. And they all sold out immediately. The only place we could get in was at the Live Casino in um, South Philly, which is, which is right in the sports complex with the arenas. Um, right, right. So, what was I going to say? So we were there um, in a sea of Eagles fans at this casino. Um, but it was great. They had a DJ there. Like, it was free admission. Um, so we were only paying for, like, our drinks and food and stuff like that. We, like, found a, a nice place to sit in front of, like, a particular screen. Every screen in the house, you know, had the game on. There was a DJ that was, like playing music in between commercial breaks so I didn't really get to watch any of the commercials which is fine but um it was amazing it was you know it was filled with Philly fans who are the most batshit crazy people ever um yes um in in the in the most beautiful way I there was like I remember the first touchdown someone lifted me off the ground at one point I don't know who they were um (laughs) But I was hoisted up into the air by a man. Um, but I was, you know, I was consenting to this. This was fine, because um, I agree. I totally agree. Yes, yes, I deserve to be elevated in this moment. But um, yes, we we have experience. Me and Callum with the power of the Philly sports fan because we yeah. were in on Broad Street for their first yeah. Super Bowl, their last, or rather their last Super Bowl appearance. It is right. wild. Three of the four Super Bowl appearances they've had are in our lifetime. Um, yeah. and they won, we rush out, out onto the street and already it's packed. We were there for like maybe an hour. Uh, and then we're like, there's one train out of Philly. And this is when things were getting, cr- like people were sh- shimmying along the side of buildings, like man on a mm-hmm. ledge. If you remember that thriller, um, <laughs> people climbing up poles, people were eating horse feces. Um, our friend Kieran was like, I'm staying all night. And I just grabbed Callum by the shirt and go, you and I, man, we, listen, look at me. We gotta get the we gotta get the hell out of here, man. These people are animals. They're gonna eat each other alive. Yeah. We gotta go, man. If we're getting out of here alive, we won't see sunrise at this rate. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, and I um, I ended up just watching the Super Bowl at home. Uh, I missed the opening kickoff because I decided before I'm like eh, I want to shave up my beard a little bit for because Valentine's Day is right around the corner. See, and- like i take this so seriously like when i say like i'm all in on things that i'm all in on like i i truly have to give my friends credit that i was there for because i was insufferably annoying i was like if you motherfuckers make me late for even a minute of this i'm going to get violent like i was a diva to the 10th degree because i do not like my football to get interrupted and i am like very superstitious about certain things like i don't I don't eat until the second quarter usually and like because I just have like a whole I have a whole ritual oh, yes. and like um, I don't let anyone interrupt it so it's like I would not even let that happen I would let nothing interrupt me seeing even a minute if I could find a way to not blink I would have yes well see that was me breaking my routine and I was like I didn't have a razor at the time so I'm like oh I'll use this cheap disposable and it'll be fine I always just get that one nick on the little bump I have on my neck and I'm like oh and then I'm like, oh, there's a couple more spots. Oh, that's a lot of blood. Oh, oh no. Oh, that's that's a that's a surprising amount of blood. How many band-aids do I have? Um, so I missed the opening kickoff like a buffoon. But um, to the game. So where to even begin? I've made a couple bullet points that I wanted to discuss. The final score ended up being 
well, this is the obvious place to start. The final score ended up being Kansas City 38, Philadelphia 35. This is the second win for the Kansas City Chiefs with a Super Bowl, I believe, since the Patrick Mahomes era began. I believe it is their fourth overall. The Kansas City Chiefs have put a bow on a pretty impressive run. Patrick Mahomes has been a starting quarterback for five years, and in those five years, he lost in the conference finals game, won the Super Bowl, lost the Super Bowl, lost in the conference final game, and won a Super Bowl. He's been in the conference finals every single year he's been in a, a quarterback, and he's won two out of three Super Bowls. Um, before we get into that side of the discussion, I'll start with the broader point. I believe this really was the two. I begrudgingly have to admit, as a Bills fan, these were truly the two best teams of the entire year. And weirdly, in a lot of ways, they are two kind of sister franchises. One, because a lot of the people who rebuilt the Kansas City Chiefs, like Andy Reid, were former Eagles alum. But also, both teams demonstrated that they are incredibly well run. Like, it's a, a thing I preach with these teams is institutional stability. So the Kansas City Chiefs have been basically good for a decade. and. When they drafted Patrick Mahomes, they realized, well, we don't need to rush him in right away. We can take our time, we can develop him. And then when he finally comes in, they go into turbo drive. A lot of people thought the Chiefs would be down this year because they had to get rid of Tyreek Hill, the star wide receiver, who's one of the fastest people in football. And yet they kind of quietly rebuilt their, every year they kind of rebuilt their team in one major way to make them better. They completely built, rebuilt their offensive line two years ago. They completely reimagined their wide receiver core this year. And yet the result is always the same. They're always in the running for a Super Bowl. Meanwhile, the Eagles, I think something that we don't appreciate is the team that got to the Super Bowl this year has very little in common with the team that won the Super Bowl. Like, basically, other than a handful of people on the offensive and defensive line and, like, one or two positional players, they're, it's basically a brand new team. And for a team to win a Super Bowl... So go into a slump and kind of have to rebuild on the fly and turn it around in basically four years, that's really impressive. Like this level, like you're normally not allowed to rebuild that quickly. Um, yes, we will get to that. Um, yeah, like normally a rebuild, a rebuild doesn't happen within three years. They usually take four to five years at best. So for them to turn it around this quickly and then immediately have this liftoff success, like, it's incredible. And it was a clash of the titans. This was a game of haymakers back and forth where both teams were just in the zone. Like, it's so funny that I talked in our previous talk about, like, oh, parody's coming back, defense is back, running the ball's back. And it's like, nope, this was best offenses in the game, throw the ball around the field, two quarterbacks, like, being like, anything you can do, I can do better. It really was a fireworks show. I hate to admit it because we lost, but it truly was one of the best Super Bowls I've ever seen and arguably one of the best of all time. And that gets us to the quarterbacks. We've already talked about how big a deal it was that it was two people of color starting in the Super Bowl. Um, I, do, I would be remiss if I did not bring up um, famous ESPN commentator Chris Berman uh, pointed this out on his broadcast and then proceeded to say, uh, so I believe his phrasing was, and we have two black quarterbacks starting in the Super Bowl. And on the same day, Abraham Lincoln was born. And, you know, I, I there's so much to unpack there. But I Who do said love, that? Uh, Chris Berman. Uh, famous homer for the Buffalo Bills. Uh, been at ESPN for decades now. Is he uh, white? Yes. Oh. A black, a no, black commentator would know better, Sydney. Were there black people in the room when he said this? Yes. I do want to go back and look at the film and see how they And react. see what the faces were. Yeah, you're going to have to. Um, yes. But I would have loved to, like, I love the butterfly effect of Abraham Lincoln signing the Emancipation Proclamation despite the Confederacy, somehow leading to Jalen Hurts and Patrick Mahomes both being really good at football at the exact same time in the exact same year. Um, Yes, but both quarterbacks basically showed what they were, and both of them are really, really good. Again, we already talked a little bit about the Patrick Mahomes legacy talk, and as frustrating as it is because this man is going to probably keep me from seeing a Super Bowl because the Bills are always going to have to go through him, he was, like, wizardly in that game. He, he basically demonstrated why he is special, because even though his receivers weren't as good as the Eagles receivers, even though he was going against the best defense in the NFL, 
He just has this wizard-like ability to just know exactly where he has to be at any given time and how exactly his arm needs to move to make an incredible play. Like, they were down 10 points, and it really did feel like they were dead to rights. And by hook or by crook, he did just rally them to the win, doing whatever he can. He also had an ankle injury, which I think is sus, because he was weirdly calm about it during the post game. so I think he was faking it. But that's just me being conspiracy theorist. But, yes, it was a, it, it was a frustrating masterclass. Out of the 27 balls he threw, he only missed on six of them. He threw three touchdowns and had a 44 yard or a 26 yard run that kind of really sealed the game for them. Meanwhile, Jalen Hurts kind of answered, because going into the season, the question was, okay, Jalen Hurts can be good, but can he be the guy? Can he be one of the five best quarterbacks in the NFL? Like, is he the guy who going up against the best quarterbacks, he'll show up, he'll play out? And the answer is an emphatic yes. And I would argue his game was more impressive than Mahomes because while Patrick Mahomes' supporting cast really came to play, like Hertz kind of had to do it all himself. This wasn't just him being surrounded by talent. This was him making plays. He threw some insanely difficult throws high in the air where only the receiver could catch it that resulted in huge plays. Uh, he ran the ball 15 times for 70 yards. He set a tied a record for most rushing touchdowns with three. Um, and... One of the big differences between him and Patrick Mahomes is uh, the Chiefs' lead rusher, Isaiah Pacheco, ran for 76 yards. The vaunted three running back team of Gainwell, Sanders, and Scott for the Eagles had a grand total of about 40. So Jalen really was doing it all himself. And perhaps no more impressive feat than to tie the game in the fourth quarter, he led an incredible drive and then proceeded to score the game tying touchdown well, he scored the touchdown that got him within two points. Mm -hmm. And then on the two-point conversion, and it is a testament to his physical skill, the minute I saw the play, it was literally he gets the ball and immediately starts running for the end zone. He needs to score this because it will give them the two points to tie the game. I immediately thought, oh, fuck, they know what the play is. He's not going to get it. And by sheer physical force of will, like there's a reason why they were talking about how much this man can deadlift. And they describe him as like a mother who gains superhuman strength to lift a car off their baby. Right. That man, his legs are just unstoppable. He just carried people into the end zone. And you're like, oh, we're going to win this game. He will just will this to happen. Wait, so how much can he deadlift? That was 600. Yes. So basically three of them. <laughs> yeah. In case you're um, wondering. The, yeah. um, wow. Sydney. That moment was so beautiful. Yes, you're a big Hertz guy, Sydney. Um, I was gonna say, like you, yeah. you've been all in on. He's not my favorite Eagle, but I, but like obviously he's my favorite quarterback. But I, I do love me some Hertz. But that moment was absolutely like peak euphoria. I'm not, I don't do drugs, but I imagine that that's what drugs feel like, or at yeah. least for me in that moment in that room. There were there were a couple moments where that room that I was in was the absolute loudest. It was like that in our initial scoring drive, this touchdown with the two-point conversion, and when we in when we re-injured Patrick Mahomes' ankle. Which those cool. moments where people were, were the absolute loudest in the yes. I mean, as foolish as it is, when you see that injury, you're like, oh, well, they're just going to win. They're up by 10. They're going into the half, and Patrick Mahomes' ankle is basically yeah. together with duct tape and, like, a song. Right, song. spit. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah like... It, it, it like it, it was one of those special moments and it sucks because he lost so it will kind of get lost in the history books but it's one of those special moments when you're watching a, a player in any sport play where it's just like this is the best man in the entire game for this specific game like at this one time in this one place for these three hours this man is simply better than everyone else at the sport they're playing he is like if you've ever seen the movie soul it's the bit where the main character is playing the piano and he's finally like figured it all out and it's allowing him to like ascend back to the soul plane. It's that like, you're just ascending to a higher level when you're playing yeah. like this. And yeah, basically every team, especially in the Patrick Mahomes era where quarterback play has skyrocketed, every team has had to look in the mirror and say, do we have a guy who can do that? Do we have a guy who can just be a su literal superhero on the field fighting literally fighting the entire team by himself and the answer for the eagles now feels like a pretty emphatic yes um going into this offseason um jalen hurts is on the last year of his contract so they will need to resign him 
and he is going to get the big bucks. And honestly, for the Eagles, it's kind of a no-brainer now because this guy feels like the guy. And one of the advantages of having a like institutionally stable franchise is even if it turns out this was the peak and it's only downhill from here, like they like the Carson Wentz contract when they signed Carson Wentz to a hundred million dollars and then he turned out to be a lemon. That should have crippled the franchise. For like <laughs> 10 years. That should have crippled the franchise for like ten years. It slowed them down for like two. And that's a testament to like a smart team knowing how to trick bad teams into helping them. So no matter what happens with Hertz, you're in a good place. Um, unfortunately, now we have to get to some of the negatives of the game. Um, the field was absolutely w- wonk. Um, yeah, you will notice- I was just gonna say like. Remember those art like some articles came out with the groundskeeper being like it smelled like a dead body. <laughs> yes, I was going to talk about that. Um, yes, so this was played at the Arizona Cardinal Stadium. I forget who they they changed the sponsors on these damn stadiums so much. I'm not 100 percent sure what's called anymore. Um, it is the State Farm Stadium. I don't think that's what originally it was called. It's a really nice stadium, and its big gimmick is it has a retractable grass. So the idea is they can let the grass out, water it, let it sit in the sun, and then move it back into the dome for the actual game. Uh, This field, which allegedly this type of grass was in the works for three years, was awful. Almost immediately, you were like, why do these players, why are people slipping so much? It looks like the defense is like on ice. And later it came, and all the players basically came out and said like, and every, like within the first quarter, everyone was changing their cleats. They were like going through shoes. And after the game, all the players were like, yeah, I don't know what was up with that field. It was really hard to move around. Like, it was very slick. Um, A couple days later, a man who self-identifies as the Saad father, um, who apparently, I I know he has a real name. He's a real human being, but I refuse to learn his real name because the name Saad father, like, if that's who he chooses to identify himself, that's what I'm going to go with. Who are we to argue? Exactly. I'm not getting in the way of that. He was like, yeah, my, my protege fucked it all up. So you're supposed to water it and then leave it in the sun Wednesday. No, they moved it in too early when it was still wet. So it never got dry. I imagine he sounds like this. Um, so it, yes, and that kind of- Add this to the work. random New York accent. Um, yeah, click him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, and it sucks because again, <laughs> There are a handful of things that made this game a bit of a bummer because it truly was one of the best Super Bowls we've ever had. And you want everything to be perfect. And the fact that these little things were not only imperfect, but actively hurt the game. This was a big thing. Yes, this was a huge thing. A lot of people are really hard on, and this is kind of like one of the big flaws for the Eagles. Their defense just was not up to its usual standard this game. Like they gave up 38 points. That's way more than they've given up basically the whole year. Um, they really, I don't believe they got a single sack or a turnover. And a lot of people were really hard on our defensive coordinator and Rich Gannon. He is, and I'm not the biggest fan of him. He falls into a camp, unfortunately, a lot of defensive coordinators fall under where they're like, look, I'm just going to have the best people possible on the field. I'm going to run the same thing every time and trust my guys are better than theirs, which works to a point. But when you're going against an offense this good, that doesn't really you have to you have to throw something new at them to confuse them. Like Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid are two of the smartest offensive minds in the league. They figured you out already. So you need to come up with three new things to confuse them. And when you combine what really hurt them was the field because like defense you're purely reacting to what the offense is doing. If you're covering someone, you have to react to how they move their feet. They know what way they're going. You don't know what way they're going. So if you have to quickly react, you're going to slip. And to the credit of the Kansas City Chiefs, they were really, really smart at taking advantage of that. And then we get to what kind of sealed the game. Well, also, I want to bring up one player individually. Uh, Carter, before um, you go on about the, like, off the topic of fields, what are your okay. thoughts that the Arizona Cardinals got ranked 31 on the Players Association list, and that's the stadium they played the Super Bowl at? And they got yeah. low scores on every sort of facility thing. The only positives were their staffs. Yes, I was going to talk about that in our off-season discussion. But yes, there was a big, 
there was a big report that came out where all of the players got to vote on like team facilities and stuff. And the Cardinals were very low on everything. And I do think this will help dictate in the future what teams get the Super Bowl or not. Because the Super Bowl's decided about five years in advance. They have like, it's like the Olympics. Each city that wants it does like a presentation where they're like, here's what we can do for you. Um, and I feel like Cardinal Stadium, even though it, ha it has hosted some of the most fun Super Bowls of all time, uh, famously the Eli Manning, the New York Giants Super Bowl, where they defeated the unbeaten Patriots. Uh, I do think this will change their opinion on that stadium going forward. Um, yes. And on top of how the Eagles lost this game, uh, there was also the botched punt. So they kicked a punt that went about 20 yards, and Kadarius Toney, and I want to talk about this motherfucker. He is a player who drives me insane. Kadarius Toney was drafted by the New York Giants and lasted there for about a year and a half. This man has not played a full season since high school. He is always hurt. It is always something with him. And yet you want to believe he will be good because he literally looks like someone who face shifts. He moves in a way human beings are not supposed to, and it results in incredible plays. And this motherfucker somehow ends up on the Kansas City Chiefs and returns a punt for about 67 yards that gives them an easy touchdown and scores another touchdown. And it's just like, of all the people who could be the dagger, it's the, if you've ever seen Wolf of Wall Street, it's the Benny Hanna thing. God, of all of the people you could have sent to bring me down, Kadarius fucking Tony. Um, and then, of course, we have to get to the play that kind of sealed the Eagles' fates, the penalty. So the game was tied. Patrick Mahomes was leading a really, really good drive to get the team into position to win the game. Uh, on third down, he threw an incompletion, and it's like, perfect. They'll kick a field goal to go up by three, and Jalen Hurts will have about a minute and 20 to get the team, you know, haul ass down the field and either tie the game or win the game. Either way, we're playing with house money. We have them where we want them. A penalty gets called on cornerback Jason Bradbury. Uh, he gets called for a hold. James. Uh, James Bradbury, thank you. The fourth, in case you were wondering. Yes. He grabs. He grabbed the wide receiver's jersey. Uh, it was a very ticky-tack call, and that's kind of what I want to get to, because there was a lot of discourse. Basically, why this penalty mattered is it gave the Chiefs a first down, which meant they're like, cool, we can run down the clock to eight seconds and then kick the field goal to take the lead. Meaning the Eagles literally just did not have a chance to score. They just didn't have enough time to get back down the field. And there has been a lot of ink spilt on both sides of this. Most people end up being like, well, it was technically a penalty. Maybe they shouldn't have called it there. Um, because usually with offense, or usually in moments like that, in like the last couple minutes of a game, especially an important game, there is an understanding that you're allowed to play a little more physical. Like they're going to be more, they're going to be less liberal with their whistles. They won't call as many penalties just because it's like, hey, let the physical guys be physical and let the game decide itself. Don't decide the game for the players. And a lot of people are like, yeah, well, that's what they should have done, but it's fine. I disagree. And that's not just because I'm a homer for the Eagles. And I'm not a homer for the Eagles. I'm a Bills fan. Because my stance, and this is what we've talked about, is... The game is so stacked against defense. The rules for the last decade have been purposely bent to go in favor of offense. You're not allowed to hit quarterbacks in certain places or at certain times. They've been very careful about like, oh, you can't hit a defenseless receiver. Like if a receiver's not looking at you going for the ball, you have to hit him here. You can't hit him here. Like so many little things have been changed to make the game, well, one safer, but also way more pro offense that you can't also give them penalties. Like it just gives them so much of an unfair advantage, especially on this field, in this context. And beyond just like costing us a chance, like, you know, were the Eagles going to go down score and win the game? Maybe, maybe not. It's, we don't know now. And that's the problem. We don't know because the refs decided the game for the game. And it's a bummer because it was genuinely one of the greatest Super Bowls of all time. And it gets undercut by this like icky, like, oh, this feels like an anti climb Debate. Yeah. It would be like an end game right in the middle. Like when Captain Marvel's desperately trying to stop Thanos from snapping his fingers, uh, he just has a heart attack and collapses. And you're like, well, I mean, we, you know, the re you know, they won, but like, that can't feel good. We didn't earn that. You know, you know we didn't get that win. The win was just decided. Yeah. So that kind of wraps up, well, I will say, and like 
I wanted to gauge how is your like for both of you, how is the reaction in your environment when <laughs> she was lost? Um, denial. Um, well, when they lost, mm -hmm. well, it's it's not denial because I, I'm I'm going from like from the time of that call on, right. um, because there's eight seconds and like they're lining up on the field mm -hmm. and our attitude is like let's go that's enough we'll time yeah that's more than enough. like we can do this um and i and that was so genuinely felt <laughs> that that we can make we can turn this these eight seconds into something um so even even after it, like the confetti is falling everyone is sort of like holding their breath you know like as if like no there's a catch right like there's something else yeah there'll be another penalty called something will happen to yeah something it. happened and this is a mistake and they're gonna sweep this confetti up and throw the green confetti instead no um and yeah it's just like it was it was sad everybody was depressed <laughs> i mean i felt like i was depressed for like three days you were, so you were I, I feel like i still am yeah like it was it, it burned it was like it felt like a death like it was so it hurt yeah i will say i was shocked how well a lot of our friends took it other than danny who was like don't talk to me for a very long time which is a very good yeah. thing to do but yeah if anything i felt like i was the angriest this was like in King of the Hill when Bill gets his touchdown record taken away in like Weasley fashion. And I'm like, why are we not more outraged? Because <laughs> like, look, there's a reason why I agreed to do this because I like to think I am a nerd who like cares about the game as it were. And it sucks that the game was decided like that, the most important game. So I'm like, right. we should be more outraged because we deserve the best stories. And that wasn't the best story. That was just a weird anti-climax. Right. As, as someone who was at a neutral site, like, were the Eagles fans losing their minds, or was it just kind of like, eh, whatever, party's over? Um, well, so I was with another person who is from the Philadelphia area, and they definitely cared more than I did. They're still not like a super sports fan, but uh, would you say there was like eight seconds left in the yeah. game or something? And they were just like, it's over, it's done. And I was just like, no, nah, hang on, we've got eight seconds in a dream, you know, a lot can happen in eight <laughs> seconds. I wasn't really that invested, but I was like, yeah, you know, something could happen. But then it didn't. And then basically all of the Chiefs fan, which were the majority of the people there, were like losing it there, going crazy. I think most of the people in Eagles jerseys then just left. <laughs> they just went home. Um, and then I continued to eat my dinner. And that was, <laughs> that was my evening. Yes, it is. It really is. And like I was talking to Sydney about this. It really is like kind of like the key moment in your fandom when you realize your team is good where you don't believe they've lost until the clock is zero and you're like fuck wait a minute the score's incorrect that's not right yeah something's like, not right here we're not winning and like for me that's a big thing because like again as a bills fan i have not had this level of success like the Eagles have been pretty damn consistently good for our entire lifetime like since they got donovan mcnab things have been generally good like there were some down years there were some really down years, but for the most part, like six and 10 was the worst they were going for a while at worst. Whereas like, I'm like going 13 and three and I'm like, okay, okay. <laughs> Why did they put us on Monday night football? This is embarrassing. Um, <laughs> yes. So for both teams, I mean, again, it's institutional stability for the chiefs. It is this, it's weird that it's like Patrick Mahomes is still under 30 because it feels like he's kind of set his legacy. If he retired today, it would be hard to argue that he's not a super, uh, Hall of Fame quarterback. Basically, there's a really clear delineative line of like, well, if you want to be one of the real big boy quarterbacks, you have to win two Super Bowls. Like anyone can win one. And that's kind of why Aaron Rodgers is in such a weird like legacy space, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, so like he is already kind of locked in. And Andy Reid, who was kind of a pariah for a lot of his time in Philadelphia and was always considered like, well, he's a good coach, but is he a great coach? Now he's kind of in like the talk for the Pantheon. He's been to four Super Bowls. He's won two. He is going to 
are possibly as depending on how long he goes, he will be up there and wins because he's going to keep winning. And he is kind of the he kind of took the torch from Bill Belichick as like the money guy in the NFL in terms of like this is the guy you want on your sideline if you want to win. Um, and for the Eagles, it's tough because again, there's a lot of young players on this team and there's a lot of excitement. And you do want to push away that thought of like, well, you know, accidents happen. You never know if you'll be back here. There's going to be a lot of overhaul on the team in terms of defense. There's a lot of free agents. I am very curious to see how a team that has been so good in the rebuild reimagines the core of this team to keep it competitive. Yeah, I don't know. This offseason has really triggered all of my abandonment issues because I did not realize how many of them were free agents. Yes, which leads us And it all into... feels personal. <laughs> right. Yeah, that is the hardest thing, understanding like how contracts and stuff Why are you work. leaving me? Yeah. Right. But that leads us into the off season, which is kind of my favorite part as a nerd who cares about like movement and stuff. Okay, so I'm gonna keep this super duper simple. Wait, are we gonna talk about the drama? Because uh, Eagles Twitter has been high drama. Yes, um, the Chiefs players have not been graceful winners. No. <laughs> um, and uh, Juju Smith Schuster has been making fun of uh, uh, Eagles players, uh, AJ Brown retaliated by calling him a quote TikTok boy, um, which is the most devastating insult you can give it someone really is. in the 2020s. Um, you might as well have just burned his house down and stolen his sheep for how like <laughs> innocent act that was. Uh, the Chiefs players did like a TikTok skit. You're more versed in this than me, Sydney. Do you want to just do you want to just quickly explain the rundown? Yeah. Yes. Explain so, it to me like I'm five in two minutes. Okay. So, there is a pussy bitch named Juju Smith-Schuster. Yeah. Um, well, and, like, let me editorialize. <laughs> the NFL does not like him. He yeah. got famous for dancing on the opposing team's logo during warm-ups on TikTok. So the rest of the NFL hates this man. Right. This was, like, his last chance to resurrect his career. Yeah, so on Twitter on Valentine's Day, he shares a tweet of this, like, fake Valentine that is a picture of the aforementioned James Bradbury IV, um, which says, I'll hold you when it matters. And that wasn't nice. We didn't like that. You didn't need to do that. Because, you know what, immediately after the game, Bradbury was really gracious and he admitted that he held him and it was nobody on the Eagles was denying what happened as upset as we were all of the players were owning up to our fate and were congratulating them and if anybody doesn't deserve this and like maybe this is petty and stupid and yeah it is it is stupid like it's a valentine but it's also like it was unnecessarily a, a dig at someone that truly did not deserve right. it. A really good say, player. The Eagles could have been dicks about this. Oh, uh, what, without a question. A few years ago, uh, the New Orleans Saints lost a critical playoff game because um, a defensive pass interference wasn't called, and Saints lost their fucking minds to the point where a senator from Louisiana threatened to have an investigation done, and the mayor <laughs> of New Orleans went as far as to say we're throwing a parade anyway because we would have won which it's like yeah okay lassie like like let's calm down a little bit here it's it's a football game so yeah. i feel like that's forced everyone else to be more chill about these things because they don't right. want to be known as the whiny diaper babies exactly so aj brown um quote tweets it and he says first off congratulations y'all deserve it this is lame you were on the way out of the league before Mahomes resurrected your career on your one-year deal, TikTok boy. He admitted that he grabbed you, but don't act like you're like that. <laughs> don't act like you're like that or ever was. But congratulations again. It's honestly um, the most pleasant, like, diss I've ever heard. It, it was sort of elegant and... <laughs> It is nice to know there's a new rivalry in the NFL. Like, now we are blood enemies. Yeah. 
Right. But now they're going to actually fight because, well, they're not going to fight because Juju is not about that life, no matter what he yeah. says, because he's really only about that TikTok life. Because right. after, way well after the fact, I showed you this screenshot. AJ wanted all of us to know he posted the screenshot for like an hour and then deleted it of a direct message to Juju, which says, I don't play them kid games. If you want to see me, I'm with it. You better go get, you better go to Cabo and enjoy your ring and stop fucking with me. Leave me off all your TikTok shit, pussy. This is his message that he said. He he posted this on Twitter and deleted it in an hour. Yes. Um, er, uh, AJ did. To that, I will just say, to be a successful wide receiver in the NFL, to be like <laughs> one of the elite of the elite, you need to be kind of a crazy person. Yeah. <laughs> like you don't, you aren't good at the most glamorous position in the NFL unless you're kind of a, like a little yeah. off culture. A rock star, yeah. But like, did you see the TikTok? I showed you that, right? Yes. That Juju made. It's confusing. Like it's I, I tried insecure to secure for a team that just won the Super Bowl. Right. I tried to watch it objectively to be like, let me see if I understand what he's trying to say here, and I don't. And like, can you imagine like buying a bunch of Eagles gear, including all of the Super Bowl gear, just to make a TikTok? He he bought like a ton of Eagles gear just for this TikTok. Yes. Um, oh what? well, I should say a fun little fact for you, Callum, is when. So they have to make all of the merch way in advance of the Super Bowl. Like, right. It's, you know, because production takes time and they want to have it ready for the actual game. So the players, whoever wins, gets to wear it on the field. But so they'll have like literal boxes of that stuff at the game ready to go. And they'll have stuff at like stores across like their respective cities and towns like ready to go. So for the team who loses the Super Bowl, famously, that stuff gets sent to like impoverished Africa. nations. Or, yeah, basically Africa. And that gives me, it, it's like a funny thing just because I'm like, in some alternate reality for some little kid in Africa, the Buffalo Bills, who lost four straight Super Bowls from 1990 to 1993, were the greatest dynasty in football history, the only team in NFL history to win four straight Super Bowls. And that's kind of a comforting thought that for some kid, the Buffalo <laughs> Bills are considered this like organiz master organization that did something no one else could do. Carter, I want you to know most of the time they don't know what those shirts say. Right. They, do, they cannot read it or, or, or just yeah. know what the symbols mean. But I want you to still have that dream somewhere. Somebody understands. Why would you do that to me, Carter? <laughs> I'm just saying. What did I do to you ever other than verbally berate people? Listen, when I was in Angola, some people were wearing some really funny shirts and they had no idea what they said. I wish I could think of an example, but some, like, they just had no idea what any of it was. But they loved it. Yes, but that all is just the subtext for the offseason. So basically, the offseason is, for a lot of the players, it is a basically their recovery time. Because this is a physically grueling sport, you need to take every minute you can to recover your body, especially for people who suffered serious injuries during the year. Um, for the NFL owners, they will have a meeting in some fancy resort to discuss possible rule changes for the season. Uh, I do love uh, the Eagles owner is coming with the suggestion that a player be allowed to wear number zero. And I'm like, who the hell on this team begged the owner to bring this up? Like, what player on the Eagles really wants to wear the number zero? And I've narrowed it down to, like, five, but I can't – I'm not going to do it until it's officially through. Um, the San Francisco 49ers are proposing that every team is required to have three quarterbacks, which I love. The Buffalo Bills, <laughs> when they lost in overtime against the Kansas City Chiefs in the playoffs, got a rule passed through that both teams had to get the ball in the playoffs – for like overtime and everyone made a big huffing fit about it where they're like oh and then when we lost in the playoffs this year it's like don't worry you didn't need to go to overtime and i'm like okay but that rule helps everyone this rule is sour grapes because we hurt their quarterback and then they didn't have a quarterback to play in the game and it's like hey you could have at any point had a third quarterback on your team but you decided you needed an eighth defensive back who only plays on the kick plays but like yay um, anyway, can we talk about um, that sort of weird delineation that the NFL is doing right now over, or the, over whether or not to make quarterback sneaks legal? Oh, yes. Um, that is one of the biggest rule changes that is coming for the team. So, um, yes, uh, Brock Purdy, the San Francisco 49ers quarterback, 
apparently it's a really serious injury. Like, apparently it's an injury that really screws up baseball players, but I digress. Anyway, so the quarterback sneak um, is that play when it's like fourth down and you got to get a couple inches. So you have the quarterback literally just- You need like one yard, yeah. Yeah, immediately tumble forward. The Eagles have kind of broke it. Are good at it, yeah. Yes, so what they would do is behind the quarterback, they would have two really big guys, like their tight ends or wide receivers, and the minute the ball was snapped, they would just shove him forward. Yeah. So when you combined Jalen Hurts's lower body strength with the fact that he's physically being shoved forward by two very strong men, combine that with the fact they had a really good, like it just was a guaranteed play. Like percentage wise, they were so far ahead of every other team on quarterback sneaks. It was it was genuine, like it was literally cheat code. Right. It was literally like the first team in Overwatch that discovered goats, where you're they like, st- oh, well, we just win. They started doing this like, variation on the quarterback snake where they line up for one and then have Jalen Hurst sort of like Scooby-Doo tick like tiptoe around the pile <laughs> while right. everybody else is in the pile and they just have him like literally tiptoeing around it. He's like, oops, well, it's also, didn't see me. Also, every other team started to copy them. Teams would have like someone move behind the quarterback and then shove into them full speed basically to give them the extra advantage. And the combination mm-hmm. of it's so overpowered and so unfair, and the combination of like, okay, this is actually kind of a dangerous play because it turns into a rugby scrum. And you're like, all it takes is one guy's leg to bend the wrong way or someone to get their back like curled, that someone will get seriously hurt. So they're probably- But that's not even the- game. But that's not even what they're arguing. They're arguing that it's not athletic or that it's not exciting to watch. And I would agree that it is both very exciting to see and obviously an extremely athletic feat, so. Oh, yes, their their reasoning is very lame. Like they have to present it because they can't just say, oh, well, it's unfair that the Eagles can do this better than everyone. Because that suggests you're punishing one team for being smarter than everyone else. Right. So they have to frame it as like, oh, it's inartful. Like it's not an athletic play. Like it doesn't, it's not actually football. And I'm like, I don't know. Football's a violent sport. Yeah, this seems like football violence and added creativity. Right. Um, yes, so that is like one of the major discussion points for the owners' meetings. Basically, the offseason is split up into two very big events. First off is free agency. So players whose contracts have expired can either be uh, unrestricted free agents or restricted free agents. Unrestricted free agents are given free pass for them and their agent to go from team to team and be like, hey, how much are you willing to give me to play for your team? Um, this year is... It's a deep class of free agents, but a kind of unsexy one for the most part. Like other than the quarterbacks, which we'll get to, it's a lot of big offensive linemen, which is a big deal because if you're a really good offensive lineman, the team usually doesn't let you leave. A lot of defensive backs. um, It was an exciting running back class, but all of the running backs got put on the franchise tag, which leads me to the franchise tag. So that makes you, basically the franchise tag is every team gets one and you can pick one player to say, we're tagging you which means you, they get, instead of getting a full contract, they get a one-year contract that is kind of the average for their position, like a mitigate, like a median uh, salary, which is still expensive, but for really good players, you kind of get them on a discount and it gives you more time to like negotiate with them. So like, you can be like, hey, you can't talk to anyone else. So let's like sit down, let's talk. Come on, let's, let's, let's figure this out. Um, yes. And that leads us to the big stories of free agency are the quarterbacks. This is a big year for both high tier quarterbacks and middle of the road quarterbacks. Um, Basically, it seems like a lot of teams have realized like, okay, maybe we can't get an elite quarterback. We can't get one of the top five best guys, but we can probably get someone in the middle who's just good enough to get us to the playoffs. The basic example of this is David Carr, who previously played for the Los Angeles or Las Vegas Raiders. Uh, he is going to the New Orleans Saints. Uh, the New Orleans Saints, Derek Carr. Did I say David? David is his brother who was uh, played for the Houston Texans and was pummeled into a pulp and was never the same. He like he yeah that guy has a record. He had the record set for most sacks on him. His brother is pretty good. Um, and it's kind of the perfect embodiment for the Saints right now where they're like, look, we don't want to tank. We don't want to like completely give up. So we're going to stay just good enough to win in this crappy division. And who knows, anything can happen in the playoffs. Uh, Geno Smith, who I described um, to you in great detail during our previous discussion, uh, he is locked in with the Seahawks. 
he's kind of a perfect fit for the Seahawks right now, where it's like, well, they still need to get a lot of good players to be a full actual contender. So keeping the quarterback position stable is really, really good. Uh, the one that's controversial is Daniel Jones, the quarterback for the Giants. He is now making more money per year than Patrick Mahomes. And here's the thing about quarterback contracts. They're always going up. Like, the Chiefs and the Bills were really, really smart to sign Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes when they did. Because the money quarterbacks are getting is only going to get higher and higher. You want to get them locked in as low as possible and like be like, oh, that's that. The fact that Daniel Jones is making this much money is simultaneously understandable, but also silly goose shit. Because, one, he is not worth that much money. He is a perfectly serviceable, middle-of-the-road quarterback who's capable of some pro surprises. But if you're the New York Giants, who have spent the last, like, seven years post-Eli Manning looking for a quarterback, like, and again, as a Bills fan, I get this. I had to put on a brave face when we're on our third quarterback in three years. Hell, our third quarterback in five, or, like, our fifth quarterback in three years, being like, this will be the guy. This will be the guy that gets us to the playoffs. So if you get a quarterback who takes you to the playoffs, you're like, let's just, this is fine. This is fine. Um, and that leads us to our big quarterbacks. Uh... Aaron Rodgers and Lamar Jackson. Um, so Aaron Rodgers, I've already shared my disdain for him. Uh, after the season ended and he got embarrassed by the anime hero himself, Jamal Williams, uh, he decided to go to a darkness retreat where you sit in a pitch black room and just, I don't know, do nothing. I don't exactly know what he did. There was a toilet and there was a sink so he could eat and drink. Um, the toilet's not connected to the eating and drinking. That was, right. I was I was about to make a comment on yeah. that, but thank you. <laughs> I realized my phrasing was incorrect. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and he has yet to talk about what he wants. Um, and the Packers have kind of quietly made it very clear they are done with Aaron Rodgers. Uh, they wanted to be done with him earlier. When they drafted Jordan Love in the first round, it was clear they wanted a succession plan. They wanted to be done in the Aaron Rodgers business. But then when you win two back-to-back -back MVPs, you're kind of stuck and you're like, God, we can't get rid of him. That looks bad. But now that he had an off year, they can be like, cool, we're done. Uh, you can either right. retire or we'll trade you. Uh, right now, the team that looks most likely to get him is the New York Jets, um, which, like, does he guarantee you a Super Bowl? No. So why are you going to spend that much? But the Jets are yeah. also another... The Jets have the current longest streak without going to the playoffs, so they're just desperate. They just want to get on base. Like, they just want to, like, achieve something. So I can understand, like, let's just sell out for this once great quarterback and hope it works out. And then Lamar Jackson has kind of become the biggest story of the offseason. To do the shortest version, um, he is a restricted... He was given a franchise tag that allows him to negotiate with other teams, and if those other teams... If the... Basically, if another team wants to sign him, they have to trade the uh, the Ravens multiple first round picks. And after, the minute this was announced, all of these teams come out and say, oh, we're not interested. We're not interested. We're not interested. And it's like, that's weird. He was an MVP like three years ago. He's one of the five to seven best quarterbacks in the NFL. The challenge is he wants to be the highest paid quarterback in the NFL. Do you remember discussion about Deshaun Watson, the sex pest quarterback? I do. I do indeed. So the biggest problem with his contract was it was completely guaranteed, which means he will get every single penny of that contract no matter what. And also, that comes straight out of the owner's like wallet. It's not a part of necessarily a part of the salary cap. The owner has to pay that himself, not through the team. And the rest of the NFL made it really clear they were unhappy that the Browns did that with Deshaun Watson. So it is very clear whether or not they've explicitly like shaken hands in a shady dark room, they have all decided they are going to declare, they are going to get out in front of this and say, no more guaranteed contracts. That was a one-time thing. And can I just say, for the NFL, it is embarrassing on a number of fronts. One, because it means a lot of mediocre teams like the Atlanta Falcons and the New York Jets and the Carolina Panthers have to basically sell their team fans on like, hey, we're not doing everything to win because of some stupid, like, union versus ownership spat. Sorry, I hope you like a less good quarterback. And also, the alternative is, okay, we're never doing this again, but the only time we did it was for a multiple accused sex criminal. It is just embarrassing, and seeing people homer for the NFL owners, a bunch of billionaires, mind you, 
mm. um, is embarrassing. Because again, there is no... Yes, Lamar Jackson has been hurt a couple times, but he is also a one-man offense. He is maybe the most... Other than Patrick Mahomes, he's the most dynamic player in the NFL. He does things that no one else on the field can do. And the Baltimore Ravens sucked this year. They were bad. And yet they still made the playoffs because Lamar Jackson is just that much better than everyone else. He is, again, he basically dragged that team to the playoffs. And when he got hurt, that was the end of their season. And I really, ugh, God, I feel bad for him because, especially because he does not have an agent. So he's doing all of this himself. And apparently, Which, times. like, what the fuck is that? Is that, like, who? I can't imagine that that functions well for him. Is this, is this? proving that that is a bad idea to be your own agent? Is that like being your own lawyer in court? Um, not necessarily. It just, <clears throat> I think it's made the relationship between him and the Baltimore Ravens more toxic because like yeah. they're talking to his face all right. of Right. He has no agent to like filter all of this language. Yeah. Um, but yes. And I to tell if him I'm we don't Lamar think Jackson, you're worth more. Yes. If I'm, if I'm the NF, if I'm the Players Association and I'm Lamar Jackson, two things need to happen. One, I need to start using the C word, collusion, because it is really hard to see a scenario where the owners don't at least have a winking understanding with each other that they're not going to let this happen. And along with the Damar Hamlin stuff we discussed about like, oh, health insurance and making sure contracts are paid out. Go scorched earth on the next union versus ownership negotiations. Like guaranteed contracts are coming whether you like them or not. And this would have been the perfect guy to set, like be the first guy to do it. It's ridiculous that you're not letting it happen. And then the second big event of the uh, off season is the draft, which is kind of one of my favorite things, even though it's weird and silly and kind of illegal when you really stop and think about it. Um, <laughs> the draft is all of the best players from college who have declared for the draft. You have to be either a junior or senior in college to be eligible. Uh, you get to get picked by an NFL team. Uh, the draft order is decided by records, and we will get into that. So the first 10 picks of this NFL draft, and there's already an asterisk on the first one, which I'll loop around to, are the Carolina Panthers, the Houston Texans, the Arizona Cardinals, the Indianapolis Colts, the Seattle Seahawks, which is very funny because that was the Russell Wilson trip draft pick. That's the draft pick they got from Denver for Russell Wilson. Uh, the Detroit Lions, who got their pick from the LA Rams, which is also very funny that two of the big draft picks of this year are for teams that were complete garbage. Um, uh, the Las Vegas Raiders, the Atlanta Falcons, the Chicago Bears, and the Philadelphia Eagles, which is very funny because they got that pick from the New Orleans Saints. So they got to be in a Super Bowl, and they still get to draft in the top 10. That's hilarious. Um, <laughs> yes. So the first overall pick is the Carolina Panthers, who literally today traded for this pick. So the Chicago Bears got the first overall pick um, in, literally on the last game of the year. Uh, the Houston Texans won their last game in embarrassingly silly fashion, uh, and it cost them the first overall pick. And because the Bears already have uh, Justin Sadfella Fields as their quarterback, they're like, well, we don't really need a quarterback. And usually when you Justin pick Cryboy Fields. Yeah. Uh, I like Justin Fields because as good as he is and as charming as he is, he always looks kind of sad and tired. He always looks, yeah. A bit melancholy Peeved. about things. Yeah, he's got uh, teen angst. Which I would be too if I were on the Chicago Bears because they're very bad yeah. right now. But they are kind of, this getting this draft pick kind of changed their fortune because not only do they have a lot of money to spend, they were able to trade this pick for two first round picks, a second round pick, multiple like various round picks. You really want picks in the first, second, and third round. That's where you get like the best like Pro Bowl level guys. Dra rounds four through seven are kind of more like, well, they could be good, or like they'll be like, you know, they'll be like depth. You know, it'll be good to have them. Anyway, so the Chicago Bears were able to trade this pick to the Panthers, who really need a quarterback. Um, to get a lot of draft picks and a really good wide receiver, DJ Moore, who immediately turns the gives the Bears offense an extra level. As what this means for the Carolina Panthers, I'm very confused on what direction they're going to go with this pick. Um, to briefly talk about some of the players in this draft, uh, there are basically four big quarterbacks. Bryce Young, who is this super athletic, super slippery, sort of ultimate leader, but he is under 200 pounds when he plays. He's around 194. 
uh, which is unprecedented for the quarterback position. He's very small. Um, he managed to weigh over 200 pounds recently, but he pointedly didn't like do any drills afterwards, which is like, oh, so you just ate a lot to get the weight. You just proved you could get the weight, but you're not going to play it that way. And as everyone's like, he's objectively the most gifted quarterback of this class, but it's like, is he going to survive more than three years in the NFL at that size? Um, CJ Stroud, the quarterback from Ohio State, if this was a few years ago, he absolutely would be the first overall pick. He is kind of like a perfect passer. He's very poised. He throws perfect dimes. He's great at reading defenses. He just does not have a lot of like improvisation skills. Like he does, he's not like Lamar. He can't like run around and do crazy stuff. Like that's kind of a necessity for a quarterback this high now. Um, will Levis, who is the ultimate, like, oh, the NFL will always talk themselves into a loudmouth white boy with a little bit of swag. Uh, he was very bad this year, but he has physical tools, and um, he's a weirdo on TikTok. Like, uh, he puts mayo in his coffee. He does weird food challenges. What? Apparently, that's a thing weird millennials are doing, or uh, whatever's below us are doing now. Um, he had a banana with the peel on. He did something with coffee grounds. I don't fucking remember. Did he, like, rub his weebly on? I don't know. He did something with coffee grounds, and it was gross. Um <laughs> I, I genuinely don't get it. Like, maybe he could be good with the right environment, but I'm like, this is, again, like, the New York Jets could have had Justin Fields, but they talked themselves into Zach Wilson, a loudmouth white boy with a little bit of swag. We do this every freaking year where some, like, tall white quarterback gets drafted too early because he, like, he's like, hello, sirs, and shakes hands well. And it's just, how do we fall for this every year? Um, and then the fourth and my personal favorite of the quarterbacks, um, Anthony Richardson. Um, so he is a freak of nature. He runs a 4440, which is as fast as like wide receivers. Uh, he basically set a record at every during every like physical like test at the combine, um, which the combine is the big draft event where all the players come together. Uh, they go through like physicals, kind of like the war or like immigration, where it's like, all right, let's make sure you're like good. Um, they do drills, they work out, they interview with teams, uh, and he kind of just blew everyone's socks off. He was not very good in college, but he also played for a very bad Florida team. And he's kind of like, he's like kind of the like mystery box where it's like, okay, we know CJ Stroud's good, but there could be anything in the mystery box. It could even be a CJ Stroud. Um, and if a team makes him work, they will look like geniuses. And my gut says, because he did so well in the combine, the Panthers panicked and they're like, we don't want to miss this guy. We got to get this guy. And they traded up and they're like, okay, no one else can get him because we have this pick. Um, and the Bears didn't really need them because they're pretty confident that, I mean, could the Bears have tra picked another quarterback and gotten rid of Justin Fields? Yes. But with quarterbacks in the NFL, the trick is like, Within the first year, you kind of know if they can run. Even if they play bad, there's like a certain level of poise and like professionalism that if you don't see, you're like, oh, this guy's not gonna, it's not gonna work. Like, like you just have to see their like, like they can keep up with the game, that they can run, they can stay on the field and not get their socks blown off. And Justin Fields has proven that. So they're like, let's not gamble because if we're wrong, then we just got rid of, like, we just, we have to start over completely. Um, and other than that, in terms of this draft, the interesting discussion was there were like two really, really, really good, um, defensive players. Um, Anderson, who is a like pass rushing linebacker from Alabama and Jalen Carter, a defensive lineman. Jalen Carter was considered the best player in this draft in terms of physical gifts. He's a defensive lineman for Georgia. He was like a freak of nature on the best defense in the entire country. During the combine, he had an arrest warrant filed on him because he was in a drag race that resulted in the death of two people. So that kind of flipped the entire draft on its head. I'm not going, obviously because it involves two deaths, I'm not gonna go too much into how that completely changes the draft, but like, yeah, there's a lot of stuff up in the air about this draft now because the best player might not be able to play this year. Um, yes, and uh, my personal favorite player in the draft is uh, Bijan Robinson, a running back from Texas. He is, uh, if he falls to the Buffalo, I would give up years of my life to have him fall to the Bills at 27. Um, he is like the ultimate debate for the draft of like, do you take the objective best player or do you pick value? Like, 
people draft quarterbacks early because it's a premium position and they want to make sure they get the best in that position. But it's like, well, that offensive lineman's technically better, like pound for pound, that running back's better pound for pound. And running backs tend to be devalued because um, running backs tend to be devalued because it's like, oh, well, you can get running backs later. But this guy is kind of like he will be a top five running back within the first five years. It's an interesting debate. Um, yeah, otherwise, the offseason is continuing to roll along as usual. Um, the Washington Commanders may finally be sold. Um, uh, it sounds like there's a delay because Dan Snyder, the current owner, wants legal protections from being sued by the other owners, and the NFL is not keen on giving him that. Uh, apparently, Jeff Bezos tried to buy the team, and Dan Snyder was like, under no circumstances. Uh, also, it came out that he straight up stole money from the company. He took out loans in the name of the uh, organization and said that he'd gotten approval from the rest of his board. Um, which does underline, like, oh, this is why, like, He's a very cash poor person like he's a billionaire in the sense of like he has theoretical dollars but he doesn't actually have that money and it is kind of interesting to see this sad decades long of nightmare finally come to a head um and yeah that kind of wraps up like our discussion until the nfl draft which is in april um do you have any questions what's the name of the uh running back you just mentioned uh, Bijan Robinson. Can you spell that? B I J A N. Oh, that's not what I was thinking in my mind. Like I'm hearing you say it, but like I could not actually tell what you were saying. Okay, thank you. Yes, I want him also on the Bills because the Bills are very good at doing food products with their players, and I think it would be very very funny to have Dijon mustard sponsored by Bijan. So Bijan's Dijon. Um, it would go up there with Terrell or T.O.'s, uh, Flutie Flakes, Josh Jacks, and um, uh, what was the other one? There's a couple others. OJ. There's some hot sauce with Josh Allen on them. Yeah, there were OJs, but you, you can't get those anymore. Right. Um, yeah, Calum, do you have any questions? Are you curious about anything with the offseason? Um, no, but I guess when does the normal season start? Um, the uh, training camp starts in July, the preseason games are in August, and then the season starts first week of September. Okay, wow. wait, when, when is the draft? Uh, it's late April. I don't remember the exact day as we speak. And then can you tell me what happens? Like what, um, well, not like, I guess with the draft, but like, what is training camp? What happens in training camp? Is it the same as baseball where they're just kind of playing games? Uh, training camp is different. You don't really play games just because it's too physically grueling a sport, but training camp will be drills, um, giving out the playbooks to the new players. For the most part, training camp is just warming up, making sure everyone's in physical shape. Occasionally you'll do a scrimmage with another team, and mostly it's deciding, like, like for good teams, it's like, all right, let's find out who are, like, the last 20 guys on this team, who are, like, the low-ranking rookies and, like, sort of mid-tier guys we want to keep, and who are we going to cut? If you've ever seen, there is a show called Hard Knocks that's all about the training camp of one team. Like they follow one team through their whole training camp. And usually they lock in on the stories about like guys who are on like the fringes, not like the Patrick Mahomes, sort of like the work pale, like, hey, I'm just like a third string lineman who's going to make his teeth playing special teams. Um, it's mostly about like who are those guys going to play or not. For middle of the road teams, it can be like, oh, we're figuring out who's actually starting for us. Like, sometimes it'll be like, oh, who's going to be our quarterback? Or what is our receiving group going to look like? Um, but for the most part, it's just getting everyone up to speed again. Gotcha. Um, yes, but, you know, we'll have more to talk about as the free agency moves on, once all the signing come in, and once the uh, draft is decided. Um, thank you both for coming today. Thank you for joining Sydney. Yeah, you know, I meant to... Um... Way back when we were talking about like Super Bowl experiences, I told you this story, Carter, but I had like, you guys want to hear something interesting um, about my hairdresser's husband who works oh, for yes. the, my hairdresser's husband. Well, like she got to, they got tickets to the Super Bowl because her husband is a carpenter for the, for the link, right? Like, yes. and I was like, what does your husband do? And then she's like, if you're at the link and your seat breaks, like he'll show up. <laughs> and mm. fix it and other stuff 
But so they got like six tickets, which included like airfare, hotel stay, and they had like events for them. And I was like, what happened? So she was telling me about like the day of and like traveling there. And she's like, yeah, we showed up to the Novacare um, complex or whatever. And they had like a Dunkin' Donuts spread like waiting for them there. And they had TSA like there. So they like privately like checked their bags and everything and like did TSA there. And then they got on like a private bus and like took them directly to a tarmac. They got a private plane to Arizona. <laughs> and, oh, actually, like, that's, um, that's a really good um, jumping off point to a final thing I can discuss. Um, as Kevin mentioned, uh, all of the players were asked to vote on like team facilities and stuff. And while there was a lot of different scores, of course, the Washington Redskins got basically F's in everything because, again, their owner <laughs> is a hack who has no money. Um, but pointedly, all of like the training and professional staffs got A's. And if there's one thing I want to take away from this messy business part of the year, it's that workers are looking out for workers. And at the end of the day, yeah. I can respect that. Yeah, yeah. She was she was explaining me she was like oh no if you like do anything for the eagles you're like considered on the team and they do like like all throughout the year she was like oh yeah we go to like events all the time blah 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 but i was not when she told me she was going i was not expecting them to have like a private plane and then yeah it was and then she said that they got like a private concert with like dj khaled like when they arrived <laughs> like they had like like there were like vip events that they were invited to I'm not making this up. <laughs> That's what she said. <laughs> that when they were there, like they were on a private plane, they got into this hotel. That like on the day of the Super Bowl, they had like a private performance with DJ Khaled. That's crazy. Wow. Well, yeah. I was a big DJ Khaled guy too. <laughs> <laughs> well, win or lose, what a ride of a season! And I'm glad we all got to be a part of it. And until next time, please don't stop the football. <laughs> Wait, is that a Rihanna song? Yeah. Uh, Please yes. don't stop the football. <laughs> I want to play some football. Throw a ball and also kick it sometimes. I just enjoy football. Football's pretty fun. Please don't stop the football. Please don't stop the. Please don't stop the. Please don't stop the football. Hey, it's first down. Hey, 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 it's first down. I can't get this part quite right. Please just fucking cut the track. <laughs>